Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. The most ADHD video game channel ever. We're playing these games released at some time in October 1982. Then Shirley's getting married, but who's the mystery groom? It's the season premiere of Laverne and Shirley. And we were last on the Dragon 32 playing Wizard War. Man, that's a good game. I would call this our diamond in the rough. I don't want anyone to forget because the front of the box, the wizard is actually rocking out. What's not to love? I got to check this one out. After Wizard War, let's see what's next. It's another game for the Dragon 32. We just can't escape that Welsh computer. This is Williamsburg Adventure 3. Very classy title there. Let's take a look at the box for Williamsburg. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> this is this is not what I expected. I thought this was going to be an educational title with Williamsburg Adventure 3. Don't worry, kids. It's most likely just ketchup, right? <laughs> there's, all, there's a ghost and gravestones on this, too? Obviously, this is not educational. That's for sure. This is, this is the actual 34th game we've played for the Dragon 32. Let's flip the cassette tape over on the back. I really don't want to... I don't want to miss the front of the box. That's amazing. <laughs> now what you'd expect. Let's play a game going back to Colonial Williamsburg, kids. I don't know if you're going to tilt your head to the side, but Williamsburg is a small colonial town where there is hidden the Golden Horseshoe. Your goal is to find it and bring home the Golden Horseshoe. Beware of evil spirits. Oh my gosh. So yeah, this game's, this game's boasting lots of crazy things. What other artwork do we have for Williamsburg Adventure 3? I believe this is part of the Micro Deal Adventure series, which I'm not keeping track of because, sorry, Micro Deal, you're just not as important as Scott Adams. And there's the cassette tape for Williamsburg Adventure 3 that we're going to play on our Dragon 32. Here we go. Let's pop in and play. Micro Deal released that's at some time in October 1982. When in October? We're just not sure. All right, this one loads up with cassette, and we're going to fast forward through all the load times and go right in to the game. Yeah. For your enjoyment, an adventure in... Williamsburg. Do we want an introduction? Sure. Yes, welcome to Micro Deal Armchair Adventure. Ah, uh, kind of like Scott Adams Adventure Games. They transport you to far lands and exotic places, like uh, Williamsburg, where someone is trying to chop you up. You can find yourself fighting ghosts, searching for hidden treasure, all from the comfort of your armchair. Uh, need to get comfortable in my armchair. Press any key to continue. You use two word commands to get book, open door, shut window, etc. So it's a two word text parser. Uh, and I believe this game does not have a save function. Remember that. If there's no save function in an adventure game, that means there's problems. You can also use north, south, east, and west to go in the appropriate direction and begin your armchair adventure, because you'll need it. All right, so you just entered Colonial Williamsburg. Your goal is to find and bring home the famous Golden Horseshoe hidden somewhere in the city. Tell the computer what you want to do using two word commands like go north, get ye flask, which won't work in this game because it don't. That's, that's three words, sorry. This game was first seen by Chromaset in September 1982 for the TRS-80 color computer. And we're going to be seeing this on other systems in 1985, I believe, for lots of other home computers. But this one is the first time we've played it here on the show. We're currently on Duke of Gloucester Street. Nothing of interest here. We have directions north, south, east, and west. Well, there's nothing of interest. Let's just, let's leave. I'll go ahead and head east. We're still on Duke of Gloucester Street, which kind of makes me feel like we're playing an educational title. This is not the Breckenridge Caper of 1796, I believe it was. It was the educational adventure game. That was way out there. There's also another one that was based on the Scarlet Letter. Which is crazy. That's a that's a video uh, adventure game, but this one is not educational whatsoever. All right, let's keep going east. <laughs> We're still on the Duke of Gloucester Street, but we do see a music teacher shop. Let's keep going east, and now we see the King's Arm Tavern. All right, so can we just say, go tavern? Yes. Now that we're in the tavern, we can see a table, a waiter, and the directions is nor or north. I wonder why they said that when you, they could easily have just put in to give us the cardinal directions. All right, let's go ahead and uh, sit at the table. Anything can happen. Once we sit at the table, we can see the waiter and dinner. Nice. All right, so let's go ahead and pay the waiter. The waiter gives you a quarter and change and sarcastically says, about all that will buy you is a map at Scribner's. Okay, so maybe he teaching us what Scribner's is. All right, let's go... 
Scribner's, if I'm spelling it right. There we go. In Scribner's bookstore. Wait a second. So how would you have known to, to, to go in the tavern, sit at the table, and from what the, uh, the player paying the waiter know to go directly to the Scribner's bookstore by saying it from sitting down at the table in the whoa that's that's some deep stuff that, that's a puzzle that uh, just warps my mind considering we've played video games from the United Kingdom uh, adventure games like this that go really far with the puzzles that's that's a, that's one of the biggest stretches uh, that, that's like well I guess we are in uh, the United Kingdom already, so yeah, makes sense to play adventure games right now. I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> they were so puzzling and crazy back then. So here we go. Uh, after we get to the Scribner's bookstore, let's go ahead and uh, we have a placard here, so let's examine it. Examine. Oh man, got to type slower. Placard. It says maps on sale. We got to get one of those. Let's buy map. What is our inventory right now? Yeah, right, we never even ate dinner, Curtis. So what, what, where's the logic in that? Just remember, when you play adventure games right now in October 1982, you, you just throw logic out the door because what really matters is persistence. Are you persistent enough to try everything into the text parser to see if the computer will understand? That's how you get to the, these games right now. Yes, Chiptune, we should. He gives us a map. Can we rob store? I don't understand that verb. Of course they don't. But still, please continue to give me... This is a live show. That's the best part of Adventure Games right now. Is sending in whatever the computer will understand. Anything. Yes, well, we paid the waiter. I don't know if we tipped the waiter. All right, so we got a map. Let's go ahead and go south now. How we knew our way was... Oh, that's right. We, it's, it told us the directions. They are splitting the screen very similar to the... I keep comparing it to Scott Adams' Adventure Games, but, I mean, he's the man with Adventure Games. Uh, we're going to be seeing his... His adventure games on lots of home computers. We already have several times, so it's 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 a good it's a good example to follow. All right, so after that, let's go ahead and go west. We're at the College of William and Mary, and there's a student here and a cannon. Can we fire the cannon? I don't understand a fire. Darn. So this is a very simplistic adventure game. This is an adventure game that is uh, only allowing certain verb commands, and there's no save function. Um, it is. I would say the best part of this version on the Dragon 32 is the box. You can't argue with this. <laughs> this this is fantastic. <laughs> I, 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 I'm speechless uh, to explain the box. So I'd say of all the games you can play right now across all home computers, I'd still say this is around a two-star range. But honestly, because of the front of the box on this one, uh, I'll, I'll go two and a half stars. And because it's not a, a, a usual colonial Williamsburg adventure. So I won't necessarily call this bad. It's it's borderline, though, bad of all the games you can play. <laughs> yeah, whatever you say, B40, B40. <laughs> all right, after that game, let's see what our next release is. Next, we're going to play on the Apple II. The next release is Wiz Plus. Let's check out Wiz Plus, starting with the box. Ooh, it's epic. The wizard saying, psst. <laughs> Want to win at wizardry? It's a magical utility program for the wizardry adventures that lets you quickly and easily change, restore, add, modify. It, so it's not really a game, but it is by Datamost. This is barely a game. It's more like an application. This is only for the Apple II, and this is the 401st game we've played on the Apple II. It's pumping out so many video games. Yeah, so this works with the uh, two games that Wizardry has out right now, Proving Grounds of the Mad Overlord that we saw in September 1981, and then Knight of Diamonds, the second scenario in August of this year, 1982. So this game is not really a game. It's more of a, a supplemental or something that you need to access and manipulate the Wizardry games. So if you don't have Wizardry, this game does not work, or this application does not work. Yeah, you can see it's an add-on. Of all the games we played or seen here on the show, this is the 13th add-on that we've played. Nowadays, we would refer to these as DLC, downloadable content, but add-ons, they're a thing, and this is another add-on. And this one, you could essentially uh, modify your uh, how many spells you have, experience points. It's it's like a, a cheater, almost. Yes. Yeah, I know, $40 for the utility. Can you believe that? I'm amazed it's that. It, that's ridiculous. Oh, and I see in the chat, Curtis, nice two and a half star. That was very generous, too. I thought it was, I was a little bit generous as well. 
All right, so this this is manual is really really nice for data most, and I also don't think this is an official like Surtex software game or, or a expansion. This is by a, a, a different company. It does tell us about wizardry, and I'm not going to go through the manual in its entirety because it's essentially telling you how you can modify all the stats of your character with wizardry on the two different games that are available right now. Oh man, yeah, lots of information. I don't even know. It's, it's a very long manual, very very lengthy. When we play this. Uh, or, or boot the game up. I really just want to show that uh, Thomas Connor did this, made this utility program because Wizardry's big, really, really big right now. And most of this is just menu based. It, it is 40 column graphics, but the opening screen is a very well done pixel art right now. So it's, look at this, very, very impressive for something that's just a utility program <laughs> or an add on, application, whatever you would want to call it. And that's it. That's all I'm going to show for Wiz Plus. We're not going to be modifying any characters here. Of all the games we played, I'm giving it zero. It's not really a game. So zero stars for Wiz Plus. Let's go play some real games. What's our next release? Our next release is on the Commodore VIC-20. Let's play some Xeno 2. Xeno 2? Where was Xeno 1? I don't think we ever saw it or there doesn't exist a Xeno 1. Maybe it was a, um, a demo or a, uh, maybe a prototype of, of some sort. Let's see what's up with Xeno 2. Yes, William Shatner, we will buy the Commodore VIC-20. Please stop. We will. This marks our 298th game we've played on the Commodore VIC-20. Almost there at 300 games. What will the 300th game be? It'll be a mystery. This box is really unique. This is by Anarog Software, the fifth game that we've seen by Anarog. Xeno 2, man. Um, so this is breaking down kind of the gameplay. The game consists of four screens, and here you can see it on the front. Original artwork, though? Something not that, that, that we haven't seen or compared it to. It's awesome. Yeah. I wouldn't call them mini games. I just call them sections. You know, the same way that when you play arcade games, think of Gorf. You know, you go from one game mode to another. That's what Xeno 2 is trying to do. Very, very nicely done. You can see on... It's all a cassette. Here in 1982, video games are played on cassette tapes. Believe that or not. And besides the box, we have the article you would have seen in magazines trying to advertise it by Anarog. Xeno 2 is on the unexpanded screen presentation with superb action-packed space thriller written entirely in machine code with four action-packed stages. It only is £7.90 right here. That's pretty good. Really good deal. Everything was cheaper in the United Kingdom for video games. There's the cassette for Xeno 2 with an example of one of them. <laughs> Maybe it was a budget one, yeah? All right, so here, let's pop in some Xeno 2 and play. This is by Jeff Gammon, released at some time in October 1982. This is Jeff Gammon's first game. If you're not familiar with Jeff Gammon, look him up right now. This is the very first thing that he's ever made, and he's still making games today. This year that we're currently posting this video, he's made games for the PlayStation 5. That's how long he's been developing. So go Jeff and welcome to video games right here with Xeno 2. <laughs> We're going to see this one later on the ZX Spectrum in 1983. And I'm looking forward to that one. It's very interesting that we see the Commodore VIC-20 version for first. Okay, so this is joystick controlled. We're going to push fire and go. First game mode begins kind of like um, dodging the meteor, uh, the meteors that are flying across the screen, but you essentially have to use your booster to stop the ship. So you can see it, I push the button, I leave, and then I have to use the joystick to thrust up, similar to Lunar Lander, while simultaneously dodging the meteoroids. It's a very quick death. It's brutally difficult, but you gotta admit, the presentation looks pretty cool. And I thought this was it. I thought this was the whole um, uh, section, but no. It has more than that. Oh man, it's tough. You gotta be able to land on the platform, and you have to be able to land very gracefully. It is not an easy affair. Here, doing the live show, I'm having... Oof, it's rough. I gotta do a lot of focus for this. Because uh, they're not pu pulling any punches out. Look at that, I got a wall. There's no way. Yep. It's also a little random. This is the very first screen. First screen is like a, an homage to Lunar Lander. And then we'll see if we can get to some other screens after this one. But the gravity's harsh too. If you look at the bottom, that's my... What? Even that was it. That was too rough. That landing was not sufficient. I had to slow down even more. Can you believe it? 
Can you get past the wall? No way. It takes a little bit of luck, but mostly you're going to be using your thrusters to slow down. You just use up all the fuel. I'm just going to crank the fuel. Yes, good. All right, moving on to the next round. Next screen, here we go. Another really fast-paced screen. Yes. So this one is... I am the red dot very quickly moving around the screen. You gotta be fast. Twitch, go. Four different directions to shoot. And I'm kind of luring the enemies to the edges. So it's it's more like this one is a multi-directional shooter on one screen. Looking pretty good. How many times do I have to do it? Oh, they got me. Is that our last one? It is, darn. So that means whenever you die, you have to go back to the first screen. Is that it? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know how to put the rest of my initials in. It was being controlled with the joystick. Kind of like we're playing in the arcade. But that's it. After you make the, you lose all your lives, you go back to the beginning again. Let's go in again and see if we can get past the lunar lander. And have enough lives to go past the second screen. Nice and easy. Just got it. You have to burn those thrusters to land on the platform. But I'm getting used to it. Looks very, very good for a Commodore VIC-20. I don't know. For 1982, I'd be willing to push through it because... But you can tell they spent some time to get this out. As the first title he's we've ever seen, or at least released, uh, this is really impressive. Gosh. Nope. Now, the controls in this, this round um, feel a little bit better, but it still is giving us the feelings we've we've seen with games like Berserk that that um or uh twin stick shooters like Robotron 2084 if you only have one stick you have to be moving and firing oh here we go next stage should look very familiar so third one is space invaders let's use all of our space invader skills knocking out the edge watch out for the bullets there i don't think i can make it across look how they, the aliens are raining bullets I, I am amazed at how difficult it is. Now, as far as Space Invaders style games, this one... Nope, go, go, go. Oh, they got me. Does it reset all the aliens, though? That's going to be tough if I have to play all the aliens over. Okay, thank you. They're too close to the bottom, though. They, they moved in so quick. I don't think I can get them. Also, I'm stuck to my seat. This is going to be really tight, especially if they're going to be speeding up this fast. Oh my gosh. My shot is so slow. I don't know how I did that. <laughs> wow. The fire rate is a little subpar compared to some of the other Space Invaders games. All right, final stage. Here it is. Fourth stage of all of them. We actually get a boss. Oh, very reminiscent of uh, Gorf or... Oh, man, is that our last life? Okay, no. Again, the, the, the firepower of the enemies. Look at all the bullets that rain down. Whoa. Yeah, that's tough. That's really tough. <laughs> Thanks, John. I have no idea how I did that one. Probably from playing all the video games up to this point. So this is cool. This is something new, something fresh. I like how it's changing the game modes up, and the uh, quality of it is, is really good. Brutally difficult, though. Very, very hard. Um, I think I've had more focus on this game than any other game we've had up to this point. So it, the controls do feel a little bit loose, especially whenever I, I felt in the Space Invaders mode. Uh, it was it was, it was was still very, very good. Of all the games you could be playing right now across all home computers, this is well done. Uh, above average, having multiple screens, multiple game modes. I, I think of it like an alternate GORF. That's what it really feels like. <laughs> I'm looking in the chat. I see a three star. Yeah, it is very difficult. Uh, and there's other games that we played on home computers that do this, switching up the, the game styles or uh, genres. Uh, the loose controls is what really brings it down, but I'll still say three and a half stars. Uh, above average, very well done for all the games on home computers, and well done, Jeff Gammon, for the first game. That's amazing. And the chat I'm seeing mostly, yeah, four for sure, Curtis, I'm with you, if it was only for the Commodore VIC-20. All right, after that intense battle, let's see what ne our next release is. 
All right, coming up next is the home release of Zaxxon. And it's not the first time the home release of Zaxxon is here. This is the one for the Atari 2600. Let's check out Zaxxon. Here's the box. Oh, it looks like most of the Coleco releases. Or at least, I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Coleco. So this, we saw originally in the arcades the beginning of this year in January. And then we've already seen the ColecoVision version in August release. So this is after that. We got blown away by how they could make Zaxxon at home. And now it's for the Atari. This will be awesome, right? Next year, we're going to see this release for the Mattel Intellivision. And this marks the 159th game we've played on the Atari 2600 or VCS. Coleco's doing what they usually do. They show the arcade cabinet on the front, and they're like, it's like the arcade. By the way, look at the arcade cabinet. They're showing a picture of the gameplay footage. Just, just remember that. Yes, remember that. Oh, yes, Curtis, this. Hold, hold, hold it till we see the gameplay, because that's exactly what's going to happen. I'm pointing out all the things that you're going to be ho hopefully expecting. Yeah, so this is by Coleco. They started doing handhelds uh, from, the, from the beginning of time, and here they are making actual video games. As we flip over the back, they explain how to play. It's a fantastic three-dimensional space battle game. Puts you in control of your futuristic spaceship. Zooms over alien asteroids, dives down to attack enemy installations. Can you survive and score? Well, we're going to find out. After all those handhelds we saw by Coleco, we then saw um, uh, Coleco released Donkey Kong, Venture, and Mousetrap, all available as uh, home releases on the Atari 2600. And then, of course, we played eight games that are for the ColecoVision you could be playing right now if you want to do consoles. And then two of them have been on the Intellivision. That's the history of Coleco as of right now. For other artwork for Zaxxon on Atari, here's one of the catalogs that says Carnival that we've seen too. Carnival's a, a good shooting gallery affair. How they did Zaxxon, though, on the ColecoVision was nice. So if you had a friend with the ColecoVision version, you got to check this one out, right? Oh, wait. But this ad right here tells you what you're really expecting. How it's... Wait a second. That doesn't look quite like Zaxxon here on this ad. And that's where it starts. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's so many games that you're going to probably dis be disappointed at, right? Yeah, get ready for Zaxxon. And the cartridge even looks very similar to the ColecoVision version. There must have been so much confusion because of how good the ColecoVision looks. Yeah, there's an example of some screenshots. And if you tell yourself, wait a second, those screenshots don't look like Zaxxon. Hopefully you played this before you bought it in stores. All right, here's the manual for Zaxxon on the Atari. It looks really similar to the ColecoVision version. Let's see what they do. They're even showing, wait a second, this is the Atari version. That's an isometric viewed ship right there. I can't believe it that they did that. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, okay, so um, this is the second Sega game that Sega has ever done for a home console. Uh, the very first uh, uh, that we ever saw was the ColecoVision version of Zaxxon, and so this is the second game that Sega's ever done for a home console. Everything else they've done so far has been in the arcades. Not that they actually did it themselves, it's more that they did the licensing uh, for the game. And yeah, here we go. <laughs> This is uh, for one or two players. If you do two players, you're going to alternate play or hot seat multiplayer. Gives us some game description. It has stunning three space game. They still are showing the Zaxxon here in the manual. What is going on? At least the way it's viewed there. Right here above my head, it explains how to get this set up on your Atari. You make sure you plug everything in. Most likely you're using RF. Awesome. <laughs> maybe if we did that chip tune, maybe I should do that before the show. Everyone, uh, just read that comment and you'll think it looks exactly like Zaxxon. For controls, there's our Atari VCS joystick. We have all the controls. Look at that. It's pointing out. It's just like Zaxxon right here. If you use the one player or two player control, you can do that too. You can choose what game you want. The game modes, they have eight different ones and they just break it down by skill level. So this one plays really similar to at least game modes, the ColecoVision where you have the skills and you just do one or two players. It looks identical. And you're just going to be hitting the game select switch. And then here we go. It begins with um, make sure you don't run out of fuel. Keep an eye on your fuel gauge. Fire at the fuel tanks to fill them up. Slip over the gap of the, the asteroid base and prepare for battle in space. Which, by the way, just a, a, a quick note on fuel gauges. Up to this point, majority of, the, majority of the time, if we needed fuel for a ship, we blow up the fuel. Uh, and the reason I'm bringing that up is there's going to be a game called River Raid coming up uh, pretty soon. River Raid, you actually don't blow up the fuel to get fuel. You have to fly through it. 
most of these games that we've seen that you need fuel for your ships, you have to shoot the fuel to get fuel. So I can understand how everyone was like, whoa, when River Raid comes out, you're going to be uh, uh, amazed at how you have to be more strategic of what you shoot at and what you fly through. Anyway, we don't know what River Raid is yet. Just pretend I didn't say that. And then it explains here, they, they're actually showing the screen what it is, where the, where the robot Zaxxon is. And the robot Zaxxon in this picture doesn't look like the normal robot. But it explains what you're supposed to do to shoot past them, how you start over. And then like most ColecoVision games, they end the manual with the fun of discovery. In other words, the manual is explaining some, but you can get a lot more by playing the game. And indeed we shall. This one was available in PAL regions as well. Let's pop it and play the first time on Atari. This is Zaxxon by Coleco Industries. Oh man, they're raining down on us. So this was released sometime in October 1982. I'm just gonna go with game mode one or the easy difficulty and reset. And then we're in. I can feel, oh yeah, cool using the joystick, being able to move the ship up and down, but I'm not playing like Zaxxon. I'm actually flying at the screen. And I can get low, fire low. If they have a shadow, I gotta pull up a little bit, I bet, right? Yeah. So like this ship here, can I get him? Yep. So I'm having to match, if you notice my ship at the bottom, I'm having to match the shadow to get um, the right height. Like this here, am I gonna be the right height for you? No, oh, I, I missed that shot. Let's see if we can get these. Looks pretty good. Control-wise, though, this feels um, uh, really good. Smooth, fun. Oh, what did I do? Did I hit a wall? Oh, I know why I hit a wall. Because of the viewpoint. <laughs> yes, if they release this as another title, another game, th if the name Zaxxon was confusing, it, it could have been called anything else because this actually plays really well. I, I am having fun playing this game, but it, it, it does not feel like Zaxxon. We played Zaxxon in the arcade. We played it on ColecoVision. That was Zaxxon. This should be called something else. It's like generous lives. If you look over on the left side, they do have a, a meter besides my shadow to determine how high or low I'm flying, which is a really nice touch. See, that was the wall again. It's kind of cool because if, if the Atari VCS was going to do sprite scaling, this game feels like it's the closest thing they could do to sprite scaling, which we've already seen in the arcades. The very beginning of sprite scaling, like from Turbo. So this game, if Atari was going to do that, this is like the best that they could do. I think it was our fuel. Yeah, fuel running out. <laughs> Got to blow up some more fuel tanks. See, I was at the wrong height again. Let's hit, see if we can hit. Nope, missed him again. Oh, I'm just crashing into the radar. Nice. So, yeah, this is not the same scrolling shoot em up uh, that we had played before. In fact, I wouldn't even call this a scrolling shoot em up compared to the other games we've seen up to this point. And since it's not isometric, it doesn't feel like Zaxxon. That's what made it different. We've already played plenty of auto scrollers that started with Scramble or Super Cobra. And so when Zaxxon showed up in the arcades, it was the perspective that made it unique. I likened it to playing a, a controlling a remote control plane in a, a, a toy box. That's what it felt like. It was it was unique and different and uh, and very fresh. What, why didn't I sh see? Why didn't I fire at that guy? Okay, what height am I supposed to be at for you? Let's see, go up a little bit more. The control for this game, though, is is very well done. Um, it's it's really fun controlling the plane going up and down, using the um, your VCS joystick, kind of like a flight stick. How do we get fuel? Just fly into it. Yeah, it's it's almost like if people were to explain Zaxxon as a scramble game or an auto scroller like scramble, but they just changed the view. So, in a way, you could say this is like Zaxxon, but with a different view. Because we have the same, similar enemy types. And the way that this is displayed on the screen is, is actually really impressive for the Atari. For a home console game, this is, is, is still really fun and really, really nice. Let's see if we can get in there. Looking good. There we go. So, I'm already seeing from the chat, three stars. Giving some spirit of Zaxxon. Yeah, I got no gripes with the controls, though. It's a, a very well-done game. And I got a little bit of firepower, too. Multiple shots there. Nice. 
Go into the next round. See, I should be able to fly all the way down. You can see where I hit the wall, it gives us a little indication I gotta get go up. Yeah, that's fun. Very, very nice. When Zaxxon first debuted in our arcades earlier this year, it was stunning all the players' groundbreaking use of the isometric perspective and 3D gameplay. So when, when Sega announced that it was going to bring it to the home console market, everyone was excited on the ColecoVision, and it, it, the excitement was through the roof. But now on the Atari version it's in our hands, you can see that it's very ambitious uh, to try to get that game to play the same on the Atari. This is the version that the Mattel and Television is going to go for as well. It's not exactly like uh, Zaxxon. So looking in the chat, I got lots of divisive ratings. Thanks so much for the ratings. We got some... Uh, averages, which is around the three-star rating. I got two and a half to three of all the games you could play right now across all home consoles. And then sound, oh yeah, sound design, three and a half stars from Manly. I even got a four-star from Charlie. So yeah, I, I don't think I've seen the chat this divisive with the video game release yet uh, of all the games you could play across all home consoles. It's anywhere from average to middling to uh, sub-average. It's impressive that <laughs> we actually have that many. Yeah, the strongest aspect is the controls. This responds really well. Get him! Oh, this is so cool to see. And the, the, if you remember that from the arcade, Zaxxon looked very different. It looked more like a, a, a robot mainframe rather than an actual robot. This one looks like you're fighting a humanoid-like creature. Yes! Let's get in some more there. Yeah, so the ship is responding very, very quickly, and the button layout's intuitive for dodging and maneuvering. You see how well this is playing so good. It's really smooth. It feels familiar to uh, the veterans of Atari shooters, so you'd be able to pick up and play this very, very easy. Uh, but it doesn't feel like it's the same as the arcade version. All right, there you go. A quick taste of Zaxxon. We only played one player and game mode one. You had four different difficulties if you wanted to. If you did two player, you'd have to take turns hot seat style anyway. So Zaxxon and the Atari 2600 is a valiant attempt to bring one of the year's biggest arcade hits to the home console. Really impressive they got it here on the same year it was released, too. In Japan, it was first in, in January. Uh, man this managed to retain the core gameplay loop of dodging enemies, shooting, and managing your fuel. But at the cost that made this arcade version so innovative is the unique 3D-like perspective and visual polish. If you're a hardcore Zaxxon fan... This port's going to feel like it's a watered-down version of the original. Most of those looking for a fun shooter on their Atari VCS library, Zaxxon is still going to deliver a decent challenge. Don't expect the groundbreaking experience you might remember from the arcades. So of all the games we could play up to this point, uh, it's th this could be great. If you don't remember on the ColecoVision home console, we were around five stars of all the games you could play. It was it was so good. I got to go all the way down to three and a half for this one. It is a well-done game. It is very, very fun. It works really well and plays really well. But it is um, lacking and minimalistic because of everything else we've seen up to this point. Yeah. And that's a good point, Curtis. The ColecoVision's already out there. So that's why it gets higher marks for sure. All right, so there you go. Zaxxon on the Atari. But we're not done. We got one more Zaxxon. Coming up next is the handheld Zaxxon. Sometime in October, these were coming out. Let's check out Zaxxon as the handheld. I got a quick video over on the left side just showing you what this handheld is like. This is the LCD game that's based on Sega's Zaxxon arcade game. Uh, the cool double panel LCD game has two LCD panels on top of each other. It, it kind of creates a this cool 3D effect with lower objects on one panel and higher objects on another. And all the background images are created uh, by the LCD are animated. So this is one of those few handheld games that is not doing an overlay you know, to show some of the graphics. It's all right there. It's very, really impressive for an LCD game, especially if you love Zaxxon, you want to collect this one. It still isn't exactly the same because it can't do a, a true isometric perspective. So what it decides to do is just have a scrolling shooter, but do it diagonally. So very nice touch. And so there's a few other games that are like this that you could be playing like Airport Panic, Frankenstein or Mr. Franken, Hikyo Amazon or Amazon, and Terror House or Akuyo no Yakato, Zaxxon. So, and this isn't the only uh, uh, Zaxxon handheld. There's another one that we're going to see in 1983. That's the vacuum fluorescent display version. And then later, there's going to be one of the Coleco tabletop handhelds. So this is the first time we've ever seen one of these. Let's take a look at the artwork for Zaxxon, the LCD handheld. <laughs> I don't know, right? 
So this is uh, by Bandai. The They've only been releasing handhelds up to this point. Everything that Bandai has brought to us is in video game form has been handheld, except for Astro Invader that was on the Emerson Arcadia 2001 home console. So here we go. This is the box of what, how you'd want to play Zaxxon. I don't know if you saw from the video, it's like a mini little nubby joystick that you use to control it. And interesting, they changed the logo. That's a good way to put, like, it's not exactly Zaxxon. So there you go. That's the handheld that we're talking about. We're going to see some other ones later for Zaxxon. If you like Zaxxon, you would enjoy the, the shooter, but eh. For, uh, as, this is another one of those handhelds that we're not able to play ourselves. So because of that, I'm going to have to rate this one zero as well. If you can give me a Zaxxon handheld, oh yeah, we'll rate and review that one. All right, so here we are, our Zaxxon Showcase. Now it's time to put our video game playing on pause. We will continue our quest playing every single video game all over the world, all consoles, all handhelds, all computers, and all arcade games. We haven't seen arcade games for quite some time. Next time on Chronologically Gaming, we finally leave October 1982 and plow into November with a brand new computer from Japan. That's it for today, and like I always say, if only you understood the power of the microprocessor. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9pm Central, so join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.